Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. I wanted to go ahead and welcome all of you to the latest in our series that we're doing with LEARN. Um, we're doing a part of a series called The Radical Embodiment, Living Well with Lipedema. So we've been doing one a month since um, June of this year, um, talking about various issues having to do with lipedema. And today, Siobhan and I are going to talk to you about an exciting project that we're doing, uh, studying, looking at um, lipedema from the perspective of someone who actually has the condition. And so I'd like to really thank uh, all of the sponsors for these LEARN Symposium series. Without these sponsors, it wouldn't be possible to put uh, these wonderful things on. Um, just realize also that all of these are recorded and they're gonna be on the website. So you will see um, this a recording of this if you happen to miss it, or if you wanna rewatch it again, it will be on the LEARN website within a week or two. And it's very important for us to point out that um, Siobhan and I are not doctors. We are not your personal healthcare provider. So um, this is meant to be informational and educational. Anything that you decide to implement uh, as a result of watching this presentation, make sure that you discuss with your healthcare provider. A little introduction for myself. I am an occupational therapist and I'm a certified lymphedema therapist. I've been treating lymphatic and fat disorders for 22 years. I'm also a researcher and that's what we're gonna be talking to you about today about a research project. And I um, study um, lymphedema, obesity and lymphedema. And I've written two books and published several papers on these topics. Some important disclosures that I am the president of the board for the Lipedema Project. I consult with the Lipedema Simplified. I'm an instructor for close training and consulting. And I also uh, consult with a uh, lymphatic lifestyle solutions program. And I'm Siobhan Huggins. I've been an independent researcher for over four years now. I focus on a variety of topics, including metabolic disease, and of course, nutrition and lipedema, a bunch of other stuff as well. I'm also a business owner and I'm the research specialist for the Lipedema Project, and I personally have Lipedema as well. In terms of my disclosures, I'm on the boards of two nonprofits, the Citizen Science Foundation and the Lipedema Project, as I mentioned. And uh, as I also mentioned, I'm the operations manager and co-owner of Own Your Labs, which is a company. So. So now to just to do a brief intro about Lipedema, um, because this presentation is a project that is researching you know, the aspects, uh, characteristics of lipedema. I just wanted to bring us all together and talk about what are the symptoms of lipedema. And so um, I give you this picture of a woman with lipedema that has what we would consider a, a classic shape, but it can come in very, a lot of a variety. But basically we're looking at someone who has um, a chronic and progressive disorder of the lymphatic and connective tissue as well as fat tissue and they develop a disproportion to um, a lot more fat to the lower body than the upper body um, and it can also affect the arms and it seems to really occur quite often during periods of hormonal flux so puberty pregnancy and um, menopause, but it can really occur at any time during a woman's life. And I say during woman's life because it's predominantly, almost exclusively, seems to occur in women. Um, we have uh, non-pitting edema. So that means if you press and hold to an area that's affected by lipedema, it seems to bounce right back out. And so it doesn't hold, it doesn't make an impression in the tissue. There's a lot of hypersensitivity and pain um, for many people who have lipedema. Um, so to those areas affected by lipedema, a seemingly innocuous light touch would be very painful to someone with lipedema. A lot of easy bruising to the areas that are affected by lipedema. And there's gonna be skin changes, including you might feel fatty nodules. So hard 
almost grain size going all the way up to a larger, like a walnut size uh, nodules. Um, you can get the cuffing um, at the wrist and at the ankle where they have an abrupt change in the size of the tissue. And so you get a kind of a cuff look at those areas. Um, and the, the skin can be very dimply. Um, we call it a mattress-like impression because so it can be very dimply. Um, and then um, one of the most common things that we hear from women is that they seem to have very limited or no response to typical dieting measures such as a low calorie, low fat diet and intense exercise seems to have no effect on the areas affected by lipedema. And then there's also um, several negative impacts on quality of life. So when we look at our project, um, and we wanted to deepen our understanding of lipedema, I really go back to the words of Dr. Matthew Carmody, who um, works with us at the Lipedema Project. And he really instilled into us the importance of listening to the patient. And this is what he did in his practice as a uh, general practitioner for many years, is that he believes that each patient has an inner wisdom and he wants to tap into that. He wants to understand their condition from their perspective. And so what we wanted to do was deepen our understanding of lipedema through someone who's living through it and experiencing lipedema. And so when we look at research in general, one of the first steps in scientific and the scientific method is observation. First, you have to look, you have to observe, you have to listen um, and without making any judgments, just take on all the, the data. And as we're listening and observing, it allows us to form a, a form, uh, to make an a hypothesis. So now we begin to say, well, maybe this is what's happening. So we make some kind of hypothesis and then um, we then see if our observations are fitting into that hypothesis. Is it supporting that or do we need to modify our hypothesis? But all of this begins to suggest where we should really concentrate our efforts and how we can uh, help someone with lipedema. So what kind of questions do we have when we're um, observing and listening to women with lipedema? We would like to know what signs should, if you're a medical provider, what signs should you be looking for that might indicate that someone might have lipedema or what should patients be looking for? How are, is the daily life of someone with lipedema? How is it affected by their lipedema? And some, what are some of those physical, emotional and social impacts of lipedema on their life? Which areas really need more attention in order to improve the experience of patients, of therapists, of physicians? Um, how can we help in those ways? And you know, there might be questions that we haven't even thought to ask, but through our observations, it might generate more questions. So really through that observing, that listening, and really acknowledging, um, validating the experience that women are reporting, it really helps us to start to find hints to the answers to these questions. And then we can really see how we can, we can start to help. So the two organizations that are involved in this research project, I wanted to just give you a little information about them. The Lipedema Project is actually a nonprofit organization, and it's really devoted to increasing the awareness about lipedema through research, through education, um, through um, all, all these activities so that we can bring uh, improve the awareness about lipedema in general. Lipedema Simplified is actually a private organization that was uh, also founded by Catherine Sayo, and it provides actual programming and resources. And it's uh, all done online. So this is global as far as programming and resources. And we really wanted to foster not only learning, but also women to woman connection, peer to peer support, um, and as well as access to experts and uh, presentations. And so a lot of learning, but connection and support. So this project that we're working on specifically, the Voice of Lipedema Research Project, it's, it has two arms. So it's a combination of first a self-report survey where women with lipedema 
have filled out that information. And then also we have a video of women that are in lipedema simplified programs and they have consented for these videos to be used, to be studied. And um, so now we have that recording of their thoughts, their, um, what they're sharing about their condition. And so these are the two things, um, two areas, two arms that we are going to be analyzing. And our purpose is to really gather as much information as we can from the patient's perspective. What were their initial signs and symptoms of lipedema? Um, what areas are they really struggling with? What has their interaction with their healthcare, their healthcare providers been like? And what management strategies have they attempted? Um, uh, and what were their experiences with them? And then just their, we would like to know the general experiences and their history of their lipedema. So when they first started seeing that something was happening and then how did that progress? How did that change? Uh, maybe exacerbations and, um, and remissions, but how did that happen over time and what was their experience with it? So I'd like to share with you what we've seen so far with the self-report survey and Siobhan will be talking about the, the videos. Um, so the self-report survey was given to all the founding members of our Lipedema tribe community. I'll be describing what that group is in a second, but it was 125 responses that we are going through that data so far. And this was in the inaugural year of the, the tribe. And so that was in 2020, early 2020. And they were given questions regarding their diagnosis, what comorbidities they had, what challenges they were facing, what treatment strategies they had attempted or were using. And I will tell you that uh, most of the questions um, were open-ended. We did not give them a choice of, for instance, what their challenges were or a choice of what treatment strategies they used. Um, this was all um, just generated by themselves. So um, the, the other thing I should also point about this self-report survey is that because they were all founding members of the, the tribe community, there we've, we've introduced somewhat of a bias because this group um, joined the tribe knowing that um, there was certain treatment strategies, for instance, that, that were being promoted. So if I go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about the tribe community. So this is um, your, uh, it's a paid membership community um, that now they have lots of opportunities for, for learning, um, for just being together in various special interest groups, um, a lot of interaction and support and also opportunities for taking courses and stuff like that. And so, um, and the group does promote um, uh, certain nutritional strategies, um, certain um, exercise and um, treatment strategies. So this um, does introduce a little bit of a bias um, to what the, the responses might've been. So looking at their, the question about their diagnosis and 74 or three quarters, about three quarters of the participants were actually diagnosed by a healthcare provider, which I thought that was a pretty good number. Um, quite often uh, women with lipedema, they're self-diagnosed. But I, I, so I was kind of surprised at, at the amount that this was actually a pretty good amount that uh, had a, a bona fide diagnosis from a healthcare provider. And um, most were in that, as you can see, stage two and stage three, um, uh, very little at the, at the ends of stage one and stage four lipedema, which you see up here pictured of the more mild to the uh, more severe stages of lipedema. Actually almost a quarter um, were not sure of that stage. And that kind of makes sense considering that um, a quarter of the participants had not yet been diagnosed by a healthcare provider. So that kind of fits with that um, response. So what challenges did they face? And so um, I thought this was very interesting and kind of what I expected that, um, that uh, pain and obesity were at the top of the list. Um, and then kind of as a result of, I'm thinking of the pain and the obesity, 
the mobility um, was almost a third of the, the patient of the participants also had difficulty with that. Um, I, I'm gonna, on the following slides, I'll do a little bit breakdown of what those quality of life and mental health issues were and the different comorbidities. Um, but you can see that there were also other challenges were just taking care of themselves and adhering to a, a special diet, um, which um, that was not always designated what that diet was, but quite often it was, it was, they did say what diet they were following. So when we look at those quality of life and mental health issues, 33 um, respondents did say specifically what those issues were. Um, and the number one, over half of them had difficulty with body dysmorphia, body image. Um, they did not like how their body looked and that this was a difficulty for them. This was a challenge for them. And um, over a quarter had suffered from depression and then um, a smaller amounts listed um, uncertainty, uncertainty about their, their condition and what was in store for them, um, having an addiction or eating disorder, and then fear and anxiety. Um, I felt like these all kind of went into uh, quality of life and mental health issues. And then for comorbidities, 36 people um, listed the comorbidities that they had. And um, by far the, the most commonly cited was lymphedema and edema um, with about two thirds of the respondents saying that. And then smaller, much smaller amounts were arthritis and autoimmune disease, various food sensitivities and getting infections. Um, very small amount said that they had diabetes, which does fit into um, what we know in the literature that there seems to be a low incidence of diabetes with lipedema. And the management strategies, this was really interesting also. And here's where we might have a bit of a bias from our group because almost half of the respondents said they used a ketogenic diet. They were joining a group that promoted using a ketogenic diet. So uh, this is probably not representative of uh, women with lipedema in general. Um, I, it was nice to see that 40% were using compression garments. Um, exercise, you can see a little bit of breakdown of what types of exercise they said. Um, so we have a lot using that. And then smaller amounts for using a pneumatic pump, using some kind of diet, and they didn't designate which kind. Some were using manual drainage or other types of massage. And then uh, supplements, vibration, some surgery and some dry brushing. Um, so, and then as far as the types of exercise, again, our, may be biased in our group, we really promote the use of some kind of, of water exercise. And we had almost half of the 39 responses said that that's the exercise they did. Um, and, but um, you can see that almost half um, did not say what the exercise was. They just said they did exercise. So, and then a much smaller um, said the group that, that said they did walking. Also very interesting on this, what, when we're back, Siobhan, uh, it's very interesting that, that um, an average of three different strategies were used by each respondent, um, but up to as many as 12. And this was without us providing a checklist of various different uh, management strategies that might be, have been tried or attempted or being used. And uh, what we're wondering is if we do this question in a different way next time and actually by using the responses that, that we've gotten, the ideas that people have put in down from this initial survey, if we now give a checklist, I have a feeling that many of the people who responded to the survey don't remember how many different things that they've tried. I get the impression that they do try a lot of different strategies and it's likely that the average amount is going to be much higher than three when they actually see a, a list and then they can, oh, I've done that, I've done that. So I think um, when we uh, move forward with this and um, update our survey instrument that we might get even more information. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna now hand it over to Siobhan and let her um, present about the videos. 
All right. So as Leslin said, uh, my task here today is to talk about the video testimonial data that we gathered. So again, this is from tribe members, so people in the Lipedema Simplified community that paid program. Um, and what this was is that basically in this data set, participants were telling their own story regarding lipedema uh, in their own words as well. So they didn't often get any prompts. They were just kind of asked, let us know what you've been through, what that was like, and what kind of issues you had. So this spanned from early life, often they mentioned their teenage years and their younger years up to the current day. And some things they were discussing was for symptoms that they noticed um, before they even knew that they had lipedema, what management strategies they're using, interactions with healthcare providers, um, and pretty much all of that, whatever came to mind for them. And because this was largely unprompted, this means that they may have left some things out, um, but it does mean that when they mention something, it's because they thought of it, they felt it was important to share. In terms of demographics, this was 18 women, um, and it was all women because, as Lesson mentioned, um, lipedema is almost exclusively impacting women. It was also a bit of an older population. So the youngest participant here was in her 30s, and a quarter of the participants were in their 60s, with the remaining participants around that age range, somewhere between uh, 50s and 80s, pretty much. In terms of the limits of the data, just as Leslin mentioned, because these were all enrolled in Lipedema Simplified programs, uh, they were probably biased <laughs> by the recommendations of that program in terms of management strategies and the holistic approach as well. It's also preliminary data. So this is a small number of people. It's only 18. And that's because this was working as a pilot of sorts to see what we could uh, learn from this type of data and see if we wanted to expand it in the future. So it's not meant to be definitive. This will almost certainly be updated in the future, um, but just to make sure that that's clear. And in terms of how lipedema was recognized in these women, a good portion were actually recognized by doctors. So that's the dark red here. Um, and this included not only primary care physicians, but also surgeons, vein specialists, uh, endocrinologists, things like that. Um, another good chunk was recognized by lymphatic and physical therapists, which isn't particularly surprising to me. It's not uncommon for people to either be misdiagnosed with lymphedema or to also have lymphedema, be sent to a lymphatic therapist, and then be recognized as also having lipedema. Um, about one-fifth were self-diagnosed, um, so they mentioned that nobody had diagnosed them. They didn't have a formal diagnosis, but they recognized it in themselves from the symptoms that they were experiencing. And a smaller portion uh, didn't disclose whether they were diagnosed or how they were recognized as having lipedema. In terms of lymph uh, lymphedema, I've included this because it does give a little bit of information in terms of how severe the lipedema is because lymphedema will appear in the later stages, uh, typically at least. And in this case, this was lipolymphedema, so lymphedema resulting from lipedema. <laughs> Um, and it was about 39% of people also had lymphedema, which I think goes towards not only how old these women were, um, but also how late they were diagnosed and how far progressed their lipedema had become. So with all that background information in place, let's go ahead and start digging in and see what we can learn from these women's stories. So number one, what kind of symptoms did they recognize in themselves before knowing that they had lipedema? All of these were around 50 to 60 percent of participants saying that they experienced these. So it's a good portion of them. And again, they may have had other symptoms, but just decided that they didn't uh, want to mention them for one reason or another. So the big thing was unexplained weight gain. And by unexplained, that typically meant that they were dieting and exercising, calorie restriction, extreme exercise, things like that, but they were still gaining weight despite that. Um, another situation was that they were gaining weight and then decided to use diet and exercise, but it wasn't working for that weight gain. Um, another aspect that kind of relates to this is that a lot of people commented on disproportionate fat distribution. Um, so this could either refer just to their body shape, so that typical lipedema shape, the larger lower body, um, and then smaller torso, or it could refer to when they were losing or gaining weight, that weight loss or gain was disproportionate, so they were losing in the waist or the torso or the face, but not the lower body, or they were specifically gaining in their lower body. 
Pain was also mentioned. Um, so painful legs or painful fat uh, specifically. And again, this was half of people commenting on this. Um, and this was either pain that was just always present or it was from normal things like blood pressure checks, uh, massage, or even gentle touching, touching or pressure on the legs. And only two participants noted that they had never had painful legs or painful fat from their recollection. The third thing was swelling or signs of swelling in the lower body and the legs. Um, this did not typically include the feet unless they also had lymphedema, but they were noticing swollen ankles, orthostatic edema, so they were becoming swollen when they were standing for long periods of time, um, or just general swelling of the legs that seemed random. And this may not seem <laughs> that interesting at first glance because, well, yeah, these are all lipidema symptoms, of course, but it's interesting also to note what they didn't mention. So they did not mention the wrist or ankle cuffing that Leslin mentioned. Um, they did not mention easy bruising or nodules, and that may just be simply be because they didn't notice them. <laughs> they didn't uh, notice them at all, or they noticed some things and just didn't think it was weird. Um, and the other aspect of this is that all of these things are potentially what people will mention to friends, family, doctors, things like that. So they're all things to keep in mind of things that people are noticing in themselves and are likely to mention. So before knowing that they had lipedema, people did report that they felt something was wrong. They felt that something was weird, even though they didn't know exactly what it was or what was causing it. And this recognition of something being unusual or something happening um, resulted in them tending to seek help repeatedly from medical professionals, typically from those symptoms that I mentioned, the pain, swelling, and uh, unique nature of the weight gain in resistance to diet. And the resistance in diet resulted in chronic dieting. Um, so a lot of people know this kind of story of you try one diet, it doesn't work, you go to the next one, or you get more extreme, things like that. Um, so they did report that as well because of the weight gain component of lipedema. And then when these efforts did not work uh, for their goals, they tended to feel a lot of self-blame. They felt like it was them um, that was failing instead of the diet failing them or having a, a specific condition that was resulting in this. In terms of experience with doctors, unfortunately, there's not a... <laughs> There's a lot of negative here, um, but this is important to talk about. So almost a quarter of people were accused of non-compliance uh, by doctors or told to try harder when diet and exercise was not effective. Um, and this goes to the quote down here in red, which says, numerous doctors over the years have told me that my continual weight gain was really me lying about what I ate and how much I exercised. Um, so you can imagine how hurtful that would be and how frustrating it would be if you know that you're complying, but you're told that can't be the case because otherwise you'd be losing weight. Uh, half of participants also felt dismissed or just not taken seriously by their doctor. And this could be when discussing lipedema symptoms in general before diagnosis, but also lipedema management after diagnosis or just lipedema in general. Um, and potentially both of these things are going to this third thing, which is that nearly half of participants uh, were interacting with doctors who did not know about lipedema. Um, so this could have been they didn't know lipedema existed at all or that they were critical of it. Um, they didn't think it was a thing um, or they just didn't know very much about it. <laughs> and so that may contribute to um, both of these, just not understanding how lipedema works or not knowing what to make of it. And when lipedema is not recognized because it can be chronic and progressive um, when not well managed, um, this can result in some negative things as well. And this included loss of mobility. So many participants did note that they had some level of mobility that had been lost as a result of the lipedema. And this could range from anything including difficulty walking long distances or going upstairs all the way to being wheelchair bound. Um, so this could heavily impact someone's life, of course. And along with that is the continued progression. So that's the weight gain that uh, may be contributing to the immobility, uh, but also continued pain, worsening pain, um, continued and worsening swelling, developing uh, lipolymphedema, all of that. And uh, struggling with body image. Uh, this was something that showed up in Leslin's data as well. People 
were struggling with this when they were gaining weight. Um, they recognized that their body was disproportionate. They didn't know why. Um, and that resulted in them struggling from that lack of understanding and frustration. And also feeling at fault because um, in these stories, women were talking about trying um, to get control of this and being unable to and feeling it was really them that was the problem. Okay, <laughs> so that was a lot of negative things. But what about the positive? Was there anything positive in this data that we can talk about so it's not all doom and gloom? And yes, luckily there is. So the number one thing um, that I found really interesting is that when these participants did recognize that they had lipedema, they jumped on it like a dog on a bone, just completely excited to learn absolutely everything they could. So nearly three quarters of participants here, uh, once they learned about lipedema and how it affected them, they were looking at the Internet. They were reading books. They were watching documentaries. They were signing up for webinars, um, <laughs> just trying to learn absolutely everything they could. And then half of participants overall also took the information that they learned and mentioned sharing it back um, a lot with their doctors to help educate them and kind of get them on their healthcare team and actively participating, um, but also with their family and other people in their community. So these are highly motivated people. They're super on this. They want to learn about it. They want to understand what is happening. Um, the other thing is that once people learned they had lipedema, it's not like they were diagnosed and it's like, okay, well, <laughs> too bad. No, like these people were actively participating in their care. Um, they were trying many different things. So the number one thing that people were trying was using ketogenic diets. Um, so again, this goes towards the bias of them being enrolled in lipedema simplified programs because this is something that's highlighted. Um, but also compression garments, which showed up in Leslin's data as well, around half of people were using compression garments. Um, and that included things like compression tights or um, compression sleeves, but also um, compression wraps as well. And people tended to use a lot of different strategies. Um, and some of these included tools like pneumatic pumps to help with swelling or vibration plates that can, um, some people say helps with fibrosis. Uh, gentle exercise and activity was also noted, um, and that's something that's also encouraged by uh, Lipedema Simplified. Pool exercises, yoga, low impact type of things, um, that's especially easy to do if you do have mobility issues. Uh, and then manual lymph drainage as well, again, to help with swelling. So these were people who were actively participating in their care, very on top of it, um, working very hard on this. So clearly this is uh, something that's helping them. Well, let's see. So what was the result of these management strategies and awareness of this condition? Well, <laughs> number one um, is very important for people, pain reduction. So pain is a large component of lipedema. It can range from mild to excruciating. And over a quarter of people uh, did comment that pain reduction did occur when they were managing lipedema. Um, along with general improvement in symptoms. So that could be improvements in swelling, um, improvements in weight gain, things like that. Um, but also there was one participant who noted that after um, using this holistic approach to lipedema care, she was actually no longer wheelchair bound. She was able to regain her mobility and she did have to relearn how to walk, but she was able to do that. Another component of this was weight loss. So almost half of people commented on experiencing weight loss, which is significant for people with lipedema because of that resistance to typical diet and weight loss. Um, strategies. And it's also worth noting that when people talked about weight loss, they didn't usually mention surgery. What they were actually talking about was this holistic approach. So swelling reduction strategies, and then of course, three quarters of them were on a ketogenic diet. Another important component of this is that it wasn't five or 10 pounds that people were talking about. Um, the lowest weight mentioned uh, that was lost was 45 pounds. And the most amount of weight loss that was mentioned was over 260 pounds. So pretty <laughs> significant, um, not even just with regards to lipedema, but just overall. Uh, and in general, a more positive outlook as well. So when people recognized that they had lipedema, they started um, to feel more accepting of their body, um, probably because they understood it better. They had a better idea of what was going on. Um, and this is also part of the holistic approach as well as that mental and psychological aspect. 
And feeling understood by community was also commented uh, by people. So these were people who had gone through a lot of experiences and shared that um, they had gone through a lot of not understanding, not being understood, and suddenly they were interacting with this community um, who knew what they were going through and they didn't have to explain. Another aspect was over half of participants mentioned that they felt grateful and hopeful as a result of access to not only their diagnosis or understanding that they had lipedema, but also access to the community, and that included not only Tribe, but the Facebook groups as well, um, and then information about lipedema as well. So navigating the future, what are some takeaway points? I know I just gave you a bunch of information. So what are some key things that we can take away from this data? And uh, where do we go from here? What can we do? And what are the next research efforts? So for one, something to note is that people did notice that something was happening, something wasn't right, something, something was weird, and they were aware of that. Um, so this included a couple things, and it's important to re-emphasize these because these are what people talk about when telling their own story, and it's what they shared with other people at the time. And that was pain with no known cause, particularly in the lower body, uh, disproportion. And when they talked about this, they were talking not only about just visually noticing that they were disproportionate, so, hey, my legs are big, but also that clothes were not fitting properly. So they may uh, buy a certain size of shirt, but then the sleeves were too small because their arms were big. Um, they may buy a certain size of pants, but then their thighs wouldn't fit. They couldn't fit into calf length or high boots because their calves were bigger compared to their feet. Um, or just that the size of their shirts was several sizes smaller than the size of their pants or bottoms. Um, the other aspect that was talked about a lot in this data was unexplained weight gain, um, either despite diet and exercise or um, it wasn't responding to diet and exercise, whichever way that came about. And also that the gain and loss that they experienced was disproportionate. So again, it was in their lower body, um, the buttocks, thighs, hips, calves, all there. Um, and also the unexplained swelling and heavy feeling um, in legs. And again, this was not typically impacting the feet. So again, this could have been orthostatic from long periods of standing or uh, seemingly random. They just noticed that they were swelling. They felt that tightness and that heavy feeling. Um, it was visibly swelling, but they didn't know why. Another important takeaway is the importance of community. Uh, community was actually the most mentioned topic in this data set. And again, this could be bias at play. These are people who are actively participating in community. Maybe they were the type of people that got more benefit from that but it at least suggests there's a portion of people who really do gain a lot of benefit from this. And if we look at how people were describing community, they used words like life-changing and a lifesaver. Um, one person described her experience with no longer being depressed as a result of being diagnosed, interacting with the community and taking um, better care of herself because she had the information to be able to do that. So this is all very, very impactful stuff that we're seeing. And the reasons for the importance of community was several fold. <laughs> so a lot of reasons, basically. One aspect was, again, being understood by others, just not having to explain yourself because people get it. They understand what you're going through, the struggles that you're facing. Sometimes just having that knowledge is very helpful. The other aspect was receiving support. Um, so having a chronic condition can be very difficult at times. Um, it's something you have to do every single day. It can get very overwhelming and having people you can turn to at any time of day or night, um, that can be very helpful as well. No longer feeling alone was another aspect. So being surrounded by people going through the same struggles and also the community helping with learning new information. So saying, hey, this new study came out. Hey, this new presentation came out. Hey, this thing, that thing, whatever, whatever. Basically um, helping share that throughout the community, but then also helping to understand that information to help parse it. Um, maybe someone isn't so science focused or used to that type of language and someone else will come over and explain it to them. And along with this, some of the information shared is other people sharing their experiences. So someone say, uh, 
says something like, oh, I'm about to try MLD. Um, what is it like? I'm really scared. I'm worried it's going to hurt. My legs are really sensitive. And someone else can come over um, and say, oh, I've tried manual lymph drainage. And here's what that's like. Here's what to expect. Here's what questions to ask. And uh, lastly, but definitely not leastly, um, interacting with the community helps people with motivation is what they reported. Um, and this makes sense because, again, it's helping you refocus on why you're doing something, the importance of what you're doing, um, other people being on the sidelines and cheering for you, um, all of that can help. Again, this is something that people need to do day in, day out. Um, it can be very time intensive. Sometimes you can get disheartened, but having people be on your side can help you <laughs> re-kickstart that. Um, and so that was something people commented on as well. So what can we do now just as people, as human beings, what can we do to help with this? Because this is a very serious problem. It's not an uncommon condition. Um, some of the estimates are one in nine women in the US may have lipedema. And as we've seen, it can be a very serious condition um, that does need proper care. And part of that is recognizing it um, as a populace, as a world. So part of it is just talking about lipedema, saying, oh, hey, did you know about this thing? Did you know this is a thing? Um, all of that. But not only that, but sharing information and resources, because it's one thing to know about lipedema. It's another thing to understand what it is, what to do, where to get help, how to get a diagnosis. Um, and another aspect of that is just spreading the message that things can be done for lipedema. Um, there are management strategies that do work. Um, not only in research papers, but also just from the experience that we saw from this data, they can have a lot of impact, they can vastly improve quality of life, um, and that some of this suffering can be avoided completely, um, or dealt with if it's already present. And finally, um, letting people know that if they have lipedema, they're not alone. So again, this is not a rare disorder. Um, it, <laughs> you could argue it's almost common. Um, and just knowing that there are other people who are going through what you're going through, um, and that there are people you can talk to who understand, um, that is very helpful as well. So on a larger scale, what kind of things need to change? What kind of things, um, should we be focusing on, um, going from this data and what people are talking about with what they struggled with? So one thing is that recognition of lipedema by medical professionals is crucial for early diagnosis and making sure people get proper management as soon as possible to avoid a lot of the suffering that we're seeing. Um, another aspect is that uh, proper management is a requirement. <laughs> it's not a bonus. Um, it's necessary for adequate support, and it does make a difference. Another part is um, support from friends and family, um, people understanding what this is, that it is a thing. Um, people have commented on their family, uh, judging them for their body, um, constantly telling them to go on diets, recommending diets, things like that. Um, and that's an additional burden along with what they're already dealing with. Um, so just better understanding on this from people in the community. And finally, that acknowledgement of lipedema as a potentially debilitating disease is incredibly important. Um, that so from what we've discussed, you know, we're talking about potentially excruciating pain, um, problems worsening to the point where mobility could be affected, people potentially developing lymphedema from this, and that could result in things like cellulitis, skin infections, things like that. Um, and those are all impactful. They impact every single aspect of people's lives. That is what people commented on this in the data. Um, and people need to know that so that things like insurance coverage, uh, we can make sure insurance is covering aspects of care. Um, workplace support, making sure that workplaces are accommodating to this, that this is taken seriously, um, and research efforts as well. So we've seen a lot more research into lipedema over the past few years, but we want that to continue. Um, we want there to be funding for this, and we want the questions that we have to be answered so that better care can be given moving forward, uh, all of that. So what comes next on the research front for us at Lipedema Simplified and Lipedema Project? Number one, as Leslin mentioned, is more granular data collection. So we ask those initial questions and now from that information and from the information that I talked about, we have more questions to ask, more detailed questions, um, making sure that we're jogging people's memories when they're answering, 
all of that. Um, so putting together new surveys, sending those out, collecting that information and doing further analysis. Next up is continuing with um, this data analysis that I just talked about with um, the video testimonials. So I think we got a lot of really good information from this, just in my personal biased opinion. Um, and we definitely wanna continue doing this, see what other patterns emerge, um, what patterns grow even more pronounced with more data points added, um, looking at uh, different contexts of testimonials, different management strategies, things like that, and seeing what else we can see. And finally, um, making more resources for people. Um, so by listening through both sets of data, we get a better idea of what people are looking for, what they need, uh, what they're struggling with, and then we can make resources for them, webinars, fireside chats, uh, just <laughs> pretty much everything you can think of, um, and making sure that those are available to people in the community. Um, and so continuing to do that and making sure that people are getting easy access to this is the important thing just to help them on their journey. Um, and feel like they have a good idea of where they're going and what to do. So that is all from us. Uh, we'll be talking to you during the Q&A right after this. Um, so if you have any questions, make sure they're in that Q&A box. Um, and of course, thank you for listening. And I hope you learned something interesting or maybe started to think about things a different way uh, or just had fun. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I, thought, I thought we got a lot of interesting information from doing this work. And, and like Siobhan says, we, we plan on continuing. There are a, a couple of questions in the Q&A box. So I would like to um, bring those up now. Uh, Francine says, are the questions still in our tribe site to refer back to? And so yes, Francine, as a tribe member, um, the questions are still there and you will find them on that, the opening page of the tribe. Um, definitely uh, contact us if you can't find it, but the, the survey in its original iteration is still there. Um, as Siobhan said, we'll be updating that. Um, Shereen asks a question that I'd like to have you address, Siobhan. Um, have you found that many folks with lipedema also have factor V Leiden blood disorder, my OTPT, who does MLD on me mentioned she sees that a lot and I have the disorder and I, I guess Cherie you're indicating that you have factor five. Um, and so can you talk about blood numbers and related to, relation to lipedema, Siobhan? Yeah, so unfortunately in terms of the research, it's still a learning point. Um, so this would be an interesting thing to ask about. And it's one of the importance of just paying attention to the community. So it's not something I've heard of personally before, but I'm glad you brought it up just so it could be on our radar. Um, just asking if this is a common thing. Um, maybe that OT is <laughs> getting a large number of them for some specific reason unrelated, um, but I would love to see information on that. So I'm gonna note that down. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Make sure yes. we circle back to it. Yeah, thank you. Because that is something that, that we do plan to examine in the future is different uh, blood numbers in relation to lipedema. So um, Sharon says she's wondering why uh, EDS, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, was not listed as a, com wasn't suggested as a comorbidity. And um, Sharon, it could be a couple different reasons. It could be that particular group of those respondents didn't have it. Cause I know that in a lot of other papers, EDS does show up as a comorbidity of uh, lipedema. The other thing is too, remember, we did not give them a list of different options. And sometimes people forget all the conditions that they have. And so, um, so that is certainly, I think we'll add it on a future iteration to see if we get any different information um, this time. But um, yes, I, I agree. There was a number of comorbidities that I was kind of expecting to see that I didn't see. Do you have any comments on that, Siobhan? Yeah, so I would guess that this is, again, it could be um, just that this population that we surveyed and did these uh, video interviews with um, didn't have EDS, but it's also just possible because of the self-report aspect of both of them 
They just didn't see it as something to mention at the time. Um, so this is where the more granular data collection comes from is we specifically put that in there. Do you have this comorbidity? Have you been diagnosed with it? Do you suspect it? And then we can collect that information because it helps people. It's easier to click a button than to remember every single thing that you have, especially if there's multiple things going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then another person asks, has there been any research on whether Durkham's is a result of advanced lipedema. And so Durkheim's is another fat disorder, specifically with painful fat nodules. And um, the only thing I've seen um, is that there is, you could definitely have both. There can be a comorbidity together of lipedema and Durkheim's disease. Um, but I have not seen something that correlates it with more advanced specifically, have you seen anything like that? No, I haven't. And my understanding is that Durkheim's is a different process than lipedema. Um, so I could see them both occurring together, but I haven't seen anything in terms of one resulting in another. But again, we're in the early stages of research, not just us as in the lipedema project, but us as in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I have no doubt it's something that'll be looked into to see how they're similar, how they're different. Um, just in myself, in terms of research, I find comparisons like that very important because you don't know what you're going to find until you look. Yeah, yeah. And even when you're looking for something else, another thing pops up that is totally unexpected. So Absolutely. And that's why it's so important just to listen and observe, um, hopefully without your own biases coloring what you may or may not be seeing. Anna says, how do patients access health professionals to diagnose? How many MD experts are there in the USA? Um, and you know, I would just add that in the world in general, and unfortunately this is not a, um, it's not a very well recognized disorder and therefore a lot of health professionals don't know about it. I mean, you really have to look to the lymphology community and um, to find uh, physicians that can diagnose. Um, I, I would say uh, very common, it is the paraprofessionals, the um, adjunct professionals like a lymphedema therapist that is seeing someone who has been diagnosed with lymphedema and they say, you seem to be showing characteristics of lipedema. This is something you may want to look into. And that's where the, it initially happens from someone who really can't give you a diagnosis, but they may be the most qualified person in your area to um, at least point you in the right direction. Um, it, it is difficult. On the Lipidiva Project website, we do have a provider directory um, and it does have uh, um, physicians and surgeons on there, um, but you're gonna see it's sparse. Um, it's, it does show the entire world um, and, and there's gonna be more of Western Europe and US, um, maybe Australia that will have more of the uh, physicians um, that can actually diagnose, it's hard to find. And um, to pursue a diagnosis, it might require you to travel. Yeah, and that's actually what I did for my diagnosis. Um, my primary care physician referred me to a specialist who's out in California. Um, and I was in a place where I could travel, but not everybody can do that. So hopefully more awareness on this leads more doctors the ability to diagnose. I know some doctors who've just recently learned about lipedema um, got acquainted with the diagnostic criteria and started diagnosing patients and recognizing that many of their patients actually had lipedema. So I think this is another aspect that will be helped with the advocacy side, um, but then also um, getting more people to contribute to that provider directory and making sure it's updated and all of that can help people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And remember it, it, you know, if your physician is willing to be educated and uh, collaborate with you, bringing in articles that describe lipedemas, for instance, the uh, lipedema uh, standard of care um, document for the US or other documents from other countries, um, those documents can be brought into your physician and hopefully they'll be willing to collaborate with you and eventually give you a diagnosis if it's not possible for you to travel to someone who is already um, very educated on lipedema. Um, Francine says, um, I would like, uh, the comment she would like to be addressed is incontinence. 
as we move forward, I have an incredible history um, just now coming forward to add to my experience. I'm not sure what, <laughs> what you're saying about that, Francine, um, but it, it's definitely, um, you know, when we look at the whole person, this can be definitely a comorbidity associated with uh, lipedema, not meaning that lipedema caused it, but it can be something that um, happens along with. Um, and uh, Francine also makes the comment that um, was, this is great uh, compilation of information and easy to read and um, uh, understand um, from this. Very grateful. Thank you, Francine, for your comments. Yeah, that's I, what we were going for. Uh -huh. And um, just wanted to, you know, really instill with everybody our excitement over um, the, the access to all this incredible information and the willingness of the participants to share um, their experiences both in, in the survey and you know, video recordings, um, really um, placing themselves in that almost vulnerable place, you know, that sharing some things that are, are very uh, personal and um, with the thought that this is gonna help other people. So we really thank all the participants that have been involved and um, hope that we can continue to gather even more information and to present to you more in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Just as Francine did, just as all the participants did, sharing what you've been through, what you're experiencing, what you're doing now is how we learn and it's how we can help other people. Once we get a better idea of what those patterns are, what people are still struggling with, all of that. So we really do appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who participated and everyone who came and watched because that's another important aspect. Thank you everyone. And hopefully we'll see you again. All right. See you next time. Bye-bye.